Today we're going to be talking about how to protect your brand. You're going to want to stay till the end of this one so you can learn how to save tons of money and headache. The first step in protecting your brand is choosing your name. Now I know this might sound like the easy part of this. In fact, you probably already have a name in mind for your business. But what you're going to want to do when you're thinking about protecting your name is think about how the United States Patent and Trademark Office is going to analyze your name when it comes to protectability. The USPTO and the courts have come up with a, a system of loosely defined terms that they use to begin to analyze whether your name is protectable. The first word is generic. Generic marks are unprotectable. These are words used to mean exactly what they mean. You can't register the name of the new toy you created if you called it Fun Toy. It is a toy, and toys are meant to be fun. So hopefully your chosen name applies to all toys the world over. You can't restrict someone from referring to their toy as a fun toy. Pick a new name. Same for your bagel store that you want to call Bagel Shop. Try again. Descriptive marks are only protectable in very limited circumstances that likely don't apply to you if you're just starting your business. For all intents and purposes, descriptive marks are also unprotectable. Descriptive marks describe an aspect of your good or service. Think clear coat for polyurethane or super bright for light bulbs. Because you can't restrict someone from describing their goods, you can't register that mark. Suggestive marks are a lot like descriptive marks, but they're different enough that they can be protectable. This is the for first category of names that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office will give you a trademark for. Whereas descriptive marks come out and tell you about the good or service, suggestive marks point your mind toward the good or service being offered, but don't come out and say it. Think Airbus for airplanes or Coppertone for tanning products. Suggestive marks are protectable, but because they border on the descriptive, you need to be careful about employing them. Arbitrary marks are very strong marks. These are words that you use in everyday English, but that through the use of your name, you are applying the word to something that it has nothing to do with. Arbitrary marks employ commonly used words that don't relate to the underlying goods or services at all. Apple is probably the best example. If an apple orchard tried to register the name, they'd be shut down. But a computer company named Apple is in the clear. Arbitrary marks will always get approved by the trademark office. Fanciful marks are the strongest of the bunch. These are made up words that have meaning only because they're associated with your goods or services. Think Rolex or Kodak. Without the watches or the cameras, these words would not be in our lexicon. I counsel my clients to always pick arbitrary or fanciful marks because these are going to be the most easily protectable marks out there. The second step in protecting your mark is conducting a trademark search. This is easily the most difficult part of the process. It's easier if you picked a fanciful or an arbitrary mark. But no matter what name you've picked, you're going to want to conduct a trademark search. The more thorough your search, the more likely that you won't run into litigation later on. So the first step in this process is simply typing your name into Google. Do a, do a regular Google search, see what pops up. As you're doing your Google searches, you're going to want to get every possible variation of your name into the Google search. So if you're using a C in your name, switch it to a K. If you're using a K, switch it to a C. 
every alternate spelling of the word, you're going to want to put those into the Google search. If you have a number in your word, you're going to want to spell out the number. You're also going to want to put the number in its numeric form. Anything that you can think of that might change the name, change the actual name of the word, but that someone else might be using, you're going to want to put that in the Google search and see what comes up. Now, what you're looking for in the Google search is other people who are using that name to apply to similar goods and services that you're going to be providing. What the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to do is look for things that are confusingly similar. If you are selling a good or service under a name that is confusingly similar to someone else providing a similar good or service, your mark's not going to be protectable. So if you run into those things as you're doing your Google search, you've got to pick a new name, start over. Now, once you're done with your Google search, now you're going to want to jump over to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's website. They have what's called the test search system there, and you're going to want to do the exact same process you did in your Google search on the test engine. Again, you're looking for names that are going to be confusingly similar to the name that you've chosen. Now, when the search results come up, there's going to be some that are marked live and some that are marked dead. Those that are live are still in use. Those that are dead are no longer in use. Each one of those is going to be a link to more information about the mark. It's going to have the address of the person who registered the mark, um, what goods and services it covers, things like that. You're going to want to look at all of that when analyzing whether or not your name is going to be considered confusingly similar. Now the live marks that are confusingly similar to yours, you're just going to want to start over with those. But as to the dead ones, you may be safe with those. But before you determine whether or not you're safe, you're going to want to pull up that additional information, find out which state that mark was originally registered from. Then you're going to want to hop over to the Secretary of State's office for that state and look up that business. If the business is still in business in the state, you'd be much better off with a different name. You don't want to have somebody say that they were already using the name once you've already gone through the process of branding your product or service. This is the safest way to do that. The last place you're going to want to check is the World Intellectual Property Organization's website. They have a search function that's similar to the test search. You're going to want to type those names in just like you did with your Google search, just like you did with your test search, and you're going to want to do the exact same process. There's a very good reason for this. Section 44 of the Lanham Act basically gives people who have registered a mark or applied for registration of a mark in another country the right to come into the United States and say, oh, but I registered first. So even if you're sa you think you're safe here because no one has that name, even after you've registered your mark and sometimes even after years have passed, somebody can come from another country, register their mark here in the United States, and because their date goes back to the date that they registered in another country, they're able to essentially supersede your mark. They become the first in time user. And that means if you end up in litigation over it, they get all of the advantages in the litigation. So check that site. I've dropped links below to the US Patent and Trademark Office's website to uh, a site that will give you all of the Secretary of State's uh, website information and to the, to the WIPO website, that's the, the, the World Organization website. So utilize those links and you'll be able to get these search results done. Now, once you find a name that is protectable in all three of those places that you've looked, it's time to register your mark. The final step in this process is registering your name. Honestly, this is the easiest part of this process. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has done a very good job 
of providing video tutorials and instructions and all the information you need to be able to make it through the process of registering your mark by yourself. I know what you're thinking. You've heard a lot of attorneys tell you that you need to hire one of us to do this process for you. But honestly, the biggest thing we spend our time on is conducting the search. If you're not comfortable with the search part of it, by all means, hire an attorney. But if you've picked a fanciful or an arbitrary mark, that search process is so much easier that you're probably not going to need the attorney to conduct that for you. So try to register your mark yourself. If you run into trouble using the tests engine and, and registering your mark on the USPTO website, at that point, you can hire the attorney. They'll come in and pick up wherever you've left off. But try to save yourself the money first. So that's it. You now have broad nationwide protection of your mark, of your brand. If there's another legal topic you want me to cover, drop a comment below. This is The Legal Good. I'm out.